Hey friends, welcome to episode two of module eight of the Anamorphic Cookbook. And in this module, we are looking over post-production steps required to deal with anamorphic footage. In the previous episode, I explained how to de-squeeze your clips and conform them to your desired aspect ratio, plus introduced you to my super useful aspect ratio calculator. I can confidently say that episode one is the most important one in this module. So go back and watch it if you haven't yet. I'm sure you'll learn a new trick or two. Today's episode teaches you how to address distortion and skewing in post-production. We'll first talk about distortion, barrel versus pincushion, and how to adjust them. Then go on a sidebar to discuss the importance of building a distortion profile for all your lenses if your project requires visual effects, plus how to collect that distortion data for your VFX team. The second part of the episode covers solutions for skewed images. That is what you get when your rigging was less than flawless and the anamorphic glass is out of alignment. This has varying degrees of intensity and can happen even to the best of us. And last, I'll look into the Mesmerizer, a Hollywood effects lens that actually uses anamorphic glass to induce adjustable skewing on the image to convey a character's state of mind. If you ask 100 anamorphic enthusiasts which is their preferred type of lens distortion, you will get a vast majority saying barrel and a couple weirdos saying pincushion. Why are the results so extreme? I believe a lot of it comes from age-old films that help shape the anamorphic look. Take the Royal Tenenbaums, for example. Notice how the image bends outwards. You'll notice this look in several other anamorphic films that not only look good, but tell compelling stories. This gets wired into our minds as a bias that says, barrel distortion equals good visuals and good stories. So if I have a lens that gives me barrel distortion, I will surely have good visuals and a good story. Right? Right? On the other side, all of Cook's anamorphic lenses display pincushion distortion, and you don't see people turning their noses and saying, Cook sucks. Uh, in fact, there's a whole thing about the Cook look that I talked about in module three, and that lots of DPs actually obsess about. But when affordable anamorphics, such as Sure, Filtrox, or Lawa, give us pincushion distortion, those lenses are as good as garbage. I find this paradox a bit funny, but mostly disheartening. Since we're in post-production, let me show you why I don't care about pincushion distortion. Resolve gives us this lens correction slider, and with a one-click adjustment, I can change my pincushion into either flat lines, which is great for visual effects, or into, oh my god, barrel distortion. We'll suffer a small loss of pixels on the sides where we push the image outwards, but no big deal. Now let's look at what happens when we try to straighten barrel distortion, shall we? Dialing the lens distortion in the opposite direction takes out a lot of the areas where we shuffle the pixels inwards. Done, we canceled out barrel distortion. If we're talking about distortion in After Effects, I made a preset called Ana Distort that gives you some eyeball control over the results. You can download it in the links below this video. Looking at what we give up to address each type of distortion, I'm more inclined to a lens that gives me light pincushion because that's easier to reverse into barrel if I really love it. Plus, it'll also give me an easier route through VFX. I mentioned VFX a handful of times so far, so you must be really on edge about that. I don't need to emphasize that visual effects are a key part in today's filmmaking, but they still get neglected and treated as an afterthought. You do that enough times and you'll notice that you never get good looking results. One of the main things you can do from the camera perspective to help with better visual effects is to collect distortion grids. Computers are masters of maths, and yet, all CGI software understands lenses as perfect designs, always rectilinear. The reason for that is you can apply your custom distortion to any rectilinear image. But in order to integrate your rectilinear CGI into your distorted shot, you will have to apply the distortion information from your lens into the CGI. Luckily for everyone, gathering that distortion information is actually sort of easy and straightforward. Ideally, you'll do that in prep and out of the set. Get all of your lenses, set up a checkerboard flat on a wall or on a board, as large as you can get, 
or a TV screen if you're really on a budget like I am, and your camera facing it straight. A pro trick here is to put a small mirror in the center of the chart. So when the camera sees itself, the lens, you know you're dead on alignment on the chart. Adjust the distance between the camera to the wall so the pattern fills up the entire frame for every lens and roll for a few seconds on it. Make sure to slate the beginning of each clip to identify them later. Your VFX team can easily extract the distortion pattern for each lens from each of these clips and use them to match any CGI or compositing necessary. You can get distortion information from a regular shot, but filming the grids makes the process much simpler and more accurate. Make post-production easier whenever you can. If you've been following the channel for a bit, you might be familiar with the story of how I almost lost all the footage for a review once because I had a wobbly lens mount and the vast majority of my clips came out skewed. That was the Atlas 40mm back in 2018, and since then I've doubled down in avoiding play on adapters, mounts, and clamps. This really came together in Module 6, so don't miss it out, as skewing is always a consequence of rigging issues. If you're still lost about what I'm talking about, skewing comes from the times when your anamorphic block is not perfectly aligned with the sensor. So the squeeze is applied at an angle, and your footage looks like this. It's pretty easy to tell your lens is misaligned when things look this bad. But sometimes it's only off by one or two degrees, and kind of hard to see it in the rush of production, or if you're not monitoring a de-squeezed image. But when you get to post and stare endlessly at each clip, all imperfections start to draw your attention. Skewing works just like that. You get more and more aware something is off and it needs fixing. This is how we deal with it. In the Effects menu, we'll pick Transform and apply it to our problematic clip. Then, in the Inspector's Effects tab, switch the control mode from sliders to interactive pins. Nothing will happen or change at first. Under your preview window, change the display info from the default transform into Open Effects Overlay. Now, confidently click to lock two opposite corners without moving them around. And with a third one, move it horizontally until you find the desired amount of de-skewing that you need. In Adobe After Effects, the key is the corner pin effect, where we'll pull each corner in opposite directions in an attempt to even out the skewing. I made a preset for that too, called NSQ, which you can also download through the links under this video. These solutions allow you to restore clips with mild to moderate skewing, but stuff that looks really off is not going to look good no matter how hard you try. Lens flyers are also a dead giveaway of skewed footage, since no solution will push them back into alignment. And what if you wanted to create skewing as a creative tool to convey a character's state of mind? That's exactly what we see in Elf when Buddy realizes he's a human. This is literally a shot rotating the anamorphic block. They didn't even bother de-squeezing it. And de-squeezing makes the effect a lot nicer. We see the effect sparingly in a few other projects, yet there's a whole effects lens designed just for this, the Mesmerizer. The Mesmerizer is nothing short of a massive anamorphic adapter that goes in front of a cinema lens and allows you to rotate its cylinders to create this weird vertigo effect. I honestly feel the effect looks better with a lesser squeeze and de-squeezing the base shot so it looks normal at first and then we vertigo into action. Here's a quick sequence that I made with the Blazar and a 1.5 times de-squeeze opposed to two times with the Mesmerizer. I guess this is not super related to post-production, but since I was in the topic of skewed images, I was really inspired to talk about it. In the next episode, we will take a look at less common issues, such as changing squeeze factor from lenses like Surrey's earlier models and many anamorphic adapters due to synchro focus and introduce a way to deal with anamorphic mumps. These you should remember from module one. And they're also a consequence of uneven squeeze, either through the focus range or across the frame. Still in this module, I'll show you how to live stream using anamorphics and a quick overview of the challenges of anamorphics for visual effects. Stay tuned. 
Thank you so much for hanging out. And from now on, you have no excuse for yelling against pincushion distortion. <laughs> I'll see you in the next one. Chit the out.